it certainly is justified that you have the debate whether it's man or machine in Formula One. It's always been the case because Formula One, the term is about the fact that there's a set of rules uh, to build a car. That's the formula that you're talking about. So it's actually a technological fight first, and then you have a driver to pilot that car around the track and try and get it to win. He was always fit and very acrobatic behind the wheel, strong in the head inside the car and outside. Michael Schumacher is a, a living legend. He's, he's known around the world. The, the, the name of Schumacher is famous everywhere. And Schumacher goes through the last corner Schumacher wins the Spanish Grand Prix. What an absolutely phenomenal drive by Michael Schumacher. He was helped by mistakes by the Renault team, but it's given him the victory that gives him the lead in the World Championship for the first time. Four months ago, Michael was 25 points behind Alonso, but he dug deep, found his best form, and won five of the next seven races. You know Michael Schumacher. Um, I understand you, you don't know him intimately, but you know him. What kind of a man is he? Well, a completely dedicated man to his sport. Um, he's obviously won more Grand Prix and more World Championships than any man in the history of Formula One. He's had a remarkable career, and then, of course, when he started with Benetton, I was with Ford Motor Company at the time. Michael Schumacher, your first ever Grand Prix win and a track where you made your debut just a year ago. How are you feeling now? I really can't describe it. I mean, it's something crazy, but I really have to say, in the, the whole weekend, I felt that we quite good, and I don't know why, but uh, when I was in the motorhome today, I thought uh, I'm able to win this race, and uh, that was unbelievable. And I have to say thank you to the team. And therefore, I had a little bit to do with what they were doing because it was a Ford engine on the Benetton. Um, and thereafter, whether it was doing television or whether it was me around Formula One, as I still am, therefore I saw a lot of them. To be in Formula One, you've got to be massively determined. 
you've got to be fully focused. Your whole life is going to revolve around the sport. You're traveling around the world for at least nine months of the year. You maybe get a bit of downtime in December and January, but that's the time you're training to get your body fit and conditioned, ready to drive a Formula One car. You're representing massive brands when you're in the car, but then you're risking your life when you're behind the wheel for those two hours on a Sunday. It's hugely intense, and you've got to be massively determined and focused. I always learn, yes, and I always learn from any driver that is in the paddock because I will analyze every person, every little detail, as much as I can in order to see what they're doing different to what I do in order then to uh, keep on improving because Formula One is about a constant improvement in every little area. It's not about suddenly somebody makes one thing completely no. different. It's, it's uh, lots of little details that, that uh, as a combination, that make the, that make the big picture. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people look at it as like, oh, they'll be like, oh, I'm just driving in circles. Like, it's just driving a car. What's physical about that? What's athletic about that? I mean, aside from the fact that it's unbearably hot, it's like sitting in a sauna. There's reflexes that have to be so, so, so fast. You also have to do lots and lots of micro adjustments across the steering wheel. You'll see them constantly moving their hands and that has to be accurate and it has to be perfectly learned. On top of all that, which is already itself really difficult, every time you brake, 
it's gonna put so much stress on your neck and your shoulders that it's gonna be basically trying to tear your head off. The G-forces that they're pulling around a corner are like four or five G just on their neck, which makes your head and the helmet, which is way, you know, four or five times what it normally would. And then as you go around the corner itself, the downforce threatens to disembowel you. You're being pulled one way at the head and then like all your guts are being shooped off to the right. If you drive feet first at 200 miles an hour around the world, sooner or later, you, you know, you're going to have a big accident and the chances are you can, you can still get hurt. The scene of the accident today, the 200 mile an hour straight, the skid marks where Schumacher left the track, skidding over the gravel into the tyres. Last night, race fans tore them apart looking for souvenirs of the wrecked car. The driver will stay in hospital at least one more night. His wounds are healing well and he is moving his legs. Currently, he is having his dressings changed and will be starting physiotherapy. If you drive feet first at 200 miles an hour around the world, Sooner or later, you, you know, you're going to have a big accident and the chances are you can, you can still get hurt. Over the gravel at 100 miles an hour, into the tyre barrier, straight through that, into the rigid wall behind. The miracle was he wasn't more seriously injured. Are you happy about track safety, how track safety was it on that corner? Well, I, you know, I, I have to speak uh, with Michael uh, about that. Uh, we have to see uh, the telemetry figures, but uh, definitely uh, in the past it could have been much worse. They were obviously in Goodyear. This year, I think it will be incredibly close. That I went round the track, didn't view that as a particularly dangerous corner. So uh, it's all a learning process for us. You know, it's the case of you know shutting the gate once the horse is bolted. With most of the world's media outside the front of Northampton General Hospital waiting for news of Schumacher's condition, an elaborate security operation was going on round the back to smuggle the driver out to a waiting ambulance. Schumacher and his wife had spent the evening playing cards and watching television, including reruns of the accident. It had been, he said, a lucky escape. Michael particularly asked us to express his thanks and to say how overwhelmed he was to receive all of the best wishes from his fans, which have come in from all over the world. His injuries are healing well, but it's still going to be a long road back to full fitness. Injuries such as he's received are serious enough if they happen on a rugby field or a soccer field to receive such injuries at such high speed inevitably involves a considerable amount of damage, not only to the bones, but also to the soft tissues. Schumacher left for a local airfield and is now being flown to a clinic in Europe to begin his rehabilitation. But no matter how good his powers of recovery, he's certain to be out for at least four races. Even he admits his chances of the world title this year are now gone. Peter Staunton, ITN, Northampton. As a racing driver, he was pretty much on the limit uh, at times. Uh, I did a survey at one point and found that he had been off the road in almost every Grand Prix weekend uh, over the three days, but not in the race. In practice, mainly, not usually in qualifying either. 
uh, but he stretched the elastic to see how fast he could go, how far the car would go without breaking away to a point where he went off the road. And he did go off the road almost every weekend in some way or another. And I always questioned that. But that was his way of living. That was his way of driving. There are many other racing drivers that you could look at and nobody has been more successful than he, but obviously very successful racing drivers who spent their time avoiding going off the road at any cost. And Michael was not one of those. Who is the highest paid athlete in the world? According to Forbes magazine, it's Michael Schumacher. He drives for Ferrari and is a four-time world champion on the Formula One racing circuit. You don't know what the conditions will be like, but Schumacher on the inside, he takes the place. Michael Schumacher overtakes Fernando Alonso for second place here. Tied on points, Schumacher leads by virtue of having won more races. On we go to Suzuka in Brazil. Tell all your friends it's going to be a thrilling finale. Only 33, he is already the most successful driver ever. Champion auto racer Michael Schumacher is fighting for his life tonight after a skiing accident yesterday in the French Alps. Schumacher, who retired last year, is the most successful driver in the history of Formula One racing. You know when a champion walks in because they've proved it. People like Schumacher, they, they tend to have two different personalities. One is in the paddock. When they walk through the gates into the Formula One paddock, they become Michael Schumacher, the driver. He admits it's been a frustrating time and told me what's so special about the new model. It's naturally uh, feeling a little bit faster. It gives you uh, a better feedback. So I'm obviously very delighted to drive it and I look forward to, to finally use it as well in the race. But uh, Obviously, after the test, we will know more. How much closer do you think it is going to be this season? I think it's going to be a very tough season, which is, in my view, going to last longer than last year. I was going to say, is it going to be tighter than last season? Oh, yes. Williams yes. are already looking... In, in my view, they are particularly strong, yeah. And they will do everything they can 
to make sure that there's almost like a shield and a shell around them to maximize their performance, to draw the best out of the team, to build a team around them, to make sure they show no signs of weakness. Not only does that draw the team in, but it also sends out a message and a sign to the teammate and also to the rest of your rivals up and down the pit lane that I'm here to win and you're gonna push it to the limit, should we say, to make sure that you achieve your goal. And then there is the Michael Schumacher who are completely different as the family people away from the glare where they still may be competitive, but they let their guard down. But when they walk through uh, the, the gates into Formula One, they are there to win, and that's what counts. He lives uh, very close to me in Switzerland. Um, he's a great family man, and you know, he's a hugely successful racing driver, well retired now, but has still had the bug for excitement, for almost danger in a way, because his motorcycle riding, his free fall, parachuting. and skiing. and he skis very well, by the way. So it's very sad to hear something that has happened yesterday to somebody who's been th through so much, survived so much, uh, and yet something like this happens as a leisure time activity. These are the people fighting to keep Michael Schumacher alive, a team of doctors whose work is now being followed around the world. Somber faced and sleep deprived, they seek to minimize the swelling in his brain. A second operation has brought them some success, but not enough to speak of optimism or survival. Brain swelling never reaches its peak immediately after an injury. It sometimes takes uh, several days for that swelling to become more severe and to reach its peak. And during that time, the team looking after the patient have got to work extremely hard to try and maintain the internal environment. He, I think, lives his life to the full and uh, continues to do so, obviously. But the only thing we can hope for is that he's in very good hands, that's for sure. Uh, his doctors have been well chosen. They have enormous experience in the type of injuries that he sustained in his skiing accident. And we can just hope and pray that their skills are gonna bring him round and allow him to come back to full function uh, as a person because He's got a lovely wife and a lovely family and a wonderful home and more than one of them. And it would be sad for him not to be able to enjoy those fully in these years to come. Once a patient has sustained a severe head injury, their brain is very vulnerable to further damage. And sometimes that damage is because of progressive swelling of the brain, uh, sometimes from other causes.
It's always a, a terrible thing to find out someone you know who's had such a heavy accident. To begin with, it didn't seem to be such a, a serious accident. Uh, it certainly didn't seem to be life-threatening because that was the first report I saw on television. Wasn't It was not life-threatening. Today's television has been much more sombre than that. And the only thing you can hope for is that consciousness is regained and the, the issues that the doctors are, and professors are concerned about at the present time can in their capable hands be put into a medical sense, uh, a recovery that hopefully will not take too long and allow them to have full bodily functions and mental agility that we know Michael Schumacher to have. Well, you know, an accident of any kind, the dynamics of an accident, we never really think about. You know, let's assume for the moment he was doing 30 miles an hour. Uh, in a downhill skiing situation, in a really top skier as he is, 30 miles an hour wouldn't be fast for him, for his abilities. And he was wearing a crash helmet, and it wouldn't be a second-rate crash helmet in the head of Michael Schumacher. He would have chosen very carefully his crash helmet, that would be for sure. But the human body sustains only so much. And when you hit a solid object, you know, most people don't realize from 30 miles an hour is the same impact as being in a third story building and falling onto a concrete floor. So when you're doing 30 miles an hour in your car, don't think that's a slow accident. The impact is huge. So if you take that back to the human person doing that 30 miles an hour, for example, or 50 kilometers an hour, and even with a helmet on, you still get transmission from the shock of hitting a, a boulder or a rock. And the, the brain, the heart, the kidneys and the lungs can only stay within the human frame for a certain number of Gs. That could be 66 Gs. If the spike is very, very narrow, it might even be 90 Gs. But if you pass that, then suddenly things dislodge. It sounds not the right thing to be saying, but when you have that type of impact, whether it be in a car or whether it be ice skating or snow skiing, you can have from time to time an accident. And that accident, if he had fallen on snow, we wouldn't be talking about this.
but obviously there was a rock somewhere, either hidden by snow or whatever happened, his, his trajectory allowed his head to hit that rock, it seems, from all reports. And now it's a repair mechanism that comes into play. And I'm sure he was airlifted the right way. I'm sure he was treated immediately the right way. And now he's in the hands of the right professors, the right specialists. And we all just, as I say, hope and pray that they will be able to do a job that the body allows them to do from the impact and the severity of the shock that his head has, has in, uh, been induced to. The sooner the patient comes out of coma, the more likely they are to make a better recovery. He's not only one of the greatest racing drivers who's ever lived, but he's a, an extraordinarily nice chap too. Michael Schumacher's a, a living legend. He's, he's known around the world. The, the, the name of Schumacher is famous everywhere. If, if you go to the Maasai warriors in Africa and you said Michael Schumacher, I'm pretty sure they would know who you're talking about. So he's well known everywhere. His career, whether it's Fangio or whether it was Jim Clark or whether it today is, is, is Sebastian Vettel, you can't say that he was better or they are better than he was at his very top career. You can say he was one of the best racing drivers that's ever lived, and that still stands. A man who lived his life in the fast lane he was always treading the line between thrill and danger. He spent over three decades behind the wheel of a race car and was fortunate enough to see his career through to retirement. However, living life in the fast lane eventually caught up with him. In 2013, Michael Schumacher suffered a head injury while skiing. Despite wearing a helmet, the impact on a snow-covered rock resulted in severe trauma to his brain. Schumacher was placed in a coma for six months. He was always fit and very acrobatic behind the wheel, strong in the head, inside the car and outside. He was a seven-time world champion. As a person, because he's got a lovely wife and a lovely family and a wonderful home and more than one of them. Holding the record for many years. Able to enjoy those fully in these years to come. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, brought, to have brought back uh, the, the, the Schumacher name into Formula One. I don't feel a, a blink of pressure. Four months ago, Michael was 25 points behind Alonso, but he dug deep, found his best form and won five of the next seven races.
I think the debate about man and machine goes all the way back to Formula One. It goes all the way back to before Formula One. It's why the concept of Formula One exists, because the idea is that you're meant to have rules that mean that these are equal machines in competition with each other. In reality, we know that no machines are equal, even if you give absolutely everyone exactly the same engine, exactly the same parts, there will be circumstances where someone fails and it's just down to raw mechanical luck. You need driving skill straight away, obviously. You need that aptitude, you need that ability to work the car, to be a, a, a one with the car. Let's talk a little bit, you mentioned you're becoming a father. When you first found that out, it must have changed your life, obviously. Becoming a f father and being a father, it's two different things. Yeah. Obviously, you, you start changing your approach towards kids. You think, a com you think completely different. You look suddenly after clothes of, of kids, of the stuff you can use for the kids, you, you try to educate yourself with books uh, yeah. about kids, all of those things, they, they have changed, yeah. dream to be here and, and you know just walking into the pilot was an amazing feeling uh, being with the team knowing that this is this is it and I got my pass and it's like you know the, the proper red F1 pass is just like wow and it's it's amazing and I'm really looking forward to it. Mick Schumacher crosses the line to win the Formula 2 Championship of 2020. And if you watch today because of the father, Mick's driving this year has ensured that the next chapter will be written by the son.